Hey, Monscon, how are we doing? Day three? Yeah, we out here, we're learning. And now guess what? You're gonna hear from a CRO at an SEO conference. Wild, right? But it turns out that if you send all of that traffic to your websites and the websites aren't doing the work for you, what's the point, right? It's all about that ROI. And in my years as a CRO, I've seen some shit. I've seen some terrible tests. Because what so often happens is that we get in a room with our, with our friends, with our colleagues, we start brainstorming ways that we can change our website. Inevitably, the highest paid opinion in the room says, oh my god, that's too risky. And behold, the button test is born. Let's just test the color of the button. It's safe, it's easy, we can implement it with just a little CSS, it's so great. I guess what? Nobody cares what color your buttons are. Nobody cares. Okay, but actually in accessibility interlude, it is very important to have a button that is able to be perceived by people with colorblind and other, obviously those wonderful uh, tips we heard yesterday in the, our accessibility talk. With those caveats, really nobody cares what color your button is because by the time they're on your website, ready to click that red or green or purple or blue button, they've already interacted with dozens, if not hundreds of your marketing touch points, which means that all of these touch points are actually our opportunity to be influencing how they perceive our products, how they perceive our brand, what benefits they might receive as a customer these are our opportunities. And so that takes us away from this science, this inherently risky thing, which of course, testing is always going to be risky, but it brings us more into the art. They're like, what could we be doing? What is out there on the internet? And yeah, we're gonna break a few eggs while we do it. But that's the fun, right? You can't have a really great omelet without breaking a few eggs. Obviously, I'm the first person to ever say that, so you heard it here first. But what I'm talking about is going out on the internet and allowing yourself to be inspired. Some of the best tests I've run on a website at a conversion point have been inspired by other people's marketing. Yes, what are the Amazons doing? What are the Etsy's doing? Because our audience doesn't live in a bubble. Like, why should our test ideas? Why should we limit ourselves to what is already on our website and already as part of our marketing arsenal? Have the confidence to go out and say, I fucking love this thing. I'm gonna take this, even though it's not related in any way, shape or form to the industry vertical I'm in, and I'm gonna make it work. Seriously, I had a 100% lift. Yes, a 100% lift because I stole something from an e-commerce website and I put it on a nonprofit website. Shouldn't happen like that, but guess what? People are shopping at Amazon, they're also gonna go and donate to my nonprofit. They're not just viewing one website. And now the fun part, we get to play with fire. Because that's the most fun part of science, right? Or is that just me? Okay, so I'm gonna have to unpack that with my therapist next week, that's okay. A little bit of pyro. <laughs> But yes, now we have wonderful ideas. We've been inspired. We're out there on the internet. We're looking. Now we have to take that step back and say, okay, so what do we, how do we actually execute this in a way that we can prove to our bosses, prove to ourselves, and prove to our literal bottom line that we are making an impact? Obviously, first thing to do, start with your data and your own observations. Yes, I am talking about the Google Analytics of the world, but also if you're in an ad platform, if you're in Search Console, what is working for your audience? Are there groups of people that are interacting with or performing differently on your website than others? These are the biggest insights we have. Like you can obviously see this is a little device report here, device category, one of my faves. We can just like take a quick look at how our audience is performing. Are we getting more traffic on one device than others? Should we be paying more attention to our mobile interface because we're getting more, more, more mobile traffic? But I'm also talking about this qualitative. What are people interacting with and what are they completely ignoring? These are fascinating because you can actually see where people are clicking. And if there is like a bunch of text, like you can see there's like a bunch of like lit up here on the headline, people often highlight for reading comprehension. 
And so those are the points where you can say, oh, people really care about what we're saying in that paragraph. Should we build an additional module? Should we pull that up to the top of the page? Should we make it more about that factoid in our headline? Because if chances are, if they're reading it that intensely, they care about it. I also encourage you to go back and tag all of your buttons, like Dana told us yesterday, so you can have some quantitative data to back up that qualitative data, because data nerd here, you got to get all that data. So here's our example. Our mobile users have small edge purchase, purchase amounts and a lower conversion rate. Simple, right? We're just at the observation stage. We're not trying to unpack why. Well, not yet. Now we are. So we've got our observations. We've looked at all of our data. Now we can start brainstorming why these differences exist. Are mobile users just in a different part of their consideration journey? Maybe, but as Pete just talked about, there are several points on that consideration journey where we can have an impact with our mobile experience. And when I'm talking about what's in your power to change, I mean literally everything on your page, not just the button. It's everything. And this is a Chime example. I'm working in financial services right now, which is, again, hard left turn from my nonprofit life. But I love watching this page because they are constantly testing on it. I take a screenshot of this page once a week, and I go back and say, OK, what'd they change? What'd they keep? Because it's fascinating to watch. So here we go. Here's an example. We've got our original observation and the things that are within our power to change. Could we nudge them to bigger purchases, suggesting different products, reframing our core benefits, maybe using a little bit of that social pressure, maybe featuring our app, if you have an app? So we've got all of our ideas. We've pulled stuff from the internet. You've taken screenshots of things that you like and hopefully have organized them in a way that's more than just keeping them on your desktop for a year. Well, I don't want to talk about it. It's a little messy. But so now we're going to go through. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> OK. Now we're going to go through and write a hypothesis. And this is where the science really starts. And I'm sure you've seen hypotheses before in your lives, probably in physical science where we did actually get to burn some stuff, which was, I know, again, fun. So we're articulating what we're going to be changing and why. Oh, they took away my Britney mic. OK. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Everything is fine. <laughs> double mic, double the fun. Here we go. So when we're articulating a hypothesis here, we are talking about what we're changing, what we want to change on this page, usually a single thing. Because again, if we change a bunch of stuff and then nothing happens, we actually don't know why nothing happened. So we're going to change something to something else. And it's going to impact a main KPI. Again, what are we trying to drive? Usually it's some sort of financial conversion or a lead generation. And the reason why you think it's going to help. Because if you don't articulate why it's going to help, why are you texting it? Why do you think it's going to make a difference? You're going to just say, like, oh, this thing will do better. Yeah, but why? And it's important to do this because you're going to learn something no matter what, even if the test fails. And when I say fails, I mean didn't, your test version didn't win. Because it's not truly a, a failure if you're learning and you're staying focused. Oh, about that, about that whole staying focused thing. Ooh, this is getting really fun. <laughs> it's an experience for all of us now. So what we're going to do is then prioritize our test experiences based on how much th we think they're going to help. We've seen so many different prioritization frameworks this week, and I freaking love all of them. And so, of course, I have one in a spreadsheet because data girl over here, everything I own is in a spreadsheet, everything. This keeps me organized, except for my desktop, which is where all my screenshots live in infamy. But so what I've done here is I've articulated all my tests. I've given them a name. I've given them a hypothesis. I've articulated you know, where they're going to run, all of this really juicy details about the nuts and bolts of my test. But then I've also calculated an effort benefit score. And so my effort benefit, benefit obviously being my expected impact, 
and my learning priority. Learning priority is something I added as a consultant because sometimes my clients were like, I want to do that thing. Make sure you capture that I want to do it. I'm like, okay, I'll give, you a, I'll give you a number. It'll be in the spreadsheet. That was five years ago. It's still in here. And then I subtract that technical effort to kind of balance that out, right? Because we don't want to do something that's going to be a huge technical impact or on our dev team that's going to take th three weeks to build when really we want, we're looking for something more in the middle. So I've added some, some numbers here, high impact three, medium impact two, subtract the medium effort, and we have a three, and now you can sort the column. Because math. So there we have it. Now we're ready to run some tests and evaluate all of our test results. So I want you to plot them out. Give them a timeline. Make sure that everyone is on board with the order of which order of tests you're going to run. This is where that effort benefit score really comes in handy because you can say, oh, this is going to be a huge technical lift for our dev team. We're going to schedule that thing for later in the year. And in the meantime, we're still going to be able to get some learnings because we know we have a couple of lower hanging fruit test ideas that won't take as long to execute. And maybe they won't be as big of an impact, but then you're constantly learning. And yes, we do need to run our tests on a certain audience size. I'm not going to go into this. I know math is hard for a lot of you, as we've discovered this week. But there are calculators for this. You can plug and play with your numbers to see how many people you need to run your tests on before you start running that test. And so then when your boss comes to you and says, hey, uh, I know that test has been running for four days. Where are my results? You can say, oh, no, wait. We still need 50,000 more visitors to this test before we're going to be able to tell you if there was a pattern of change. And I usually try to let my test run for at least two weeks to like normalize a bit of that weirdness in the data. So if you're running an email campaign or if there's like a promo that goes up or if you've done really well with digital PR and you've gotten a bunch of traffic to your site over the course of two or three days, you let that traffic sort of normalize so that you understand what's actually working for the full audience, not just the weirdos who clicked on a link somewhere. I mean, we like those people. That's the point, right? Doing great with your digital PR. And then we're reaching for something called confidence, statistical significance. What does this actually mean? If you're not a scientist, this is like kind of a tricky concept to understand. We're evaluating a pattern of change so that we're confident that if we did the exact same thing 20 times, 19 times out of 20, we would get the exact same result. That's really all we're talking about with statistical significance. It's not that complicated. If you want to get into the complicated weeds, you can find me during the break because I will nerd out about that all day long. But if you check those results too often, we're doing what's called a repeat significant test and we're introducing this random chance. The possibility that at the moment that we check the test results, it just so happens that we have a winner. So these are results from the exact same test taken two weeks apart. On the left, you can see my control is the winner. 96% chance to win. We should have pulled the plug, right? Like right away. But always let your data normalize because two weeks later, lo and behold, our test version was the winner. And if we had pulled the plug at the beginning of that test with what we did find out was just our email traffic, we would have ended up losing a bunch of money and losing a bunch of opportunity from the rest of our audience. So that was a lot. The steps are actually pretty easy. First thing to do is be inspired. Don't keep yourself in your bubble. Don't keep yourself within your industry. Go out there. If you see something that you love, take a screenshot. Take it to your boss. Say. I think we can do X, Y, Z with this thing. I think it would be really cool. If this other person is doing it, it might work for us too. The next thing, build your hypotheses. Never, ever, 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 ever run a test without a hypothesis. Finally, prioritize. Ruthlessly prioritize. You can't run every test. Not a single person in here, no matter how big their website or how enterprise their scale is, can run every single test that they want to run. It's just not physically possible. And then go back to the beginning. Take what you've learned, build on your plan, add those things to the roadmap. 
Even if your boss is like, oh, I have this really great idea, we should absolutely do this thing next, you can say, we'll add it to the roadmap and evaluate its effort and benefit score. <laughs> and of course, don't forget to share with your colleagues. What we found is that only 14% of businesses are saying they're sharing their, exper their experimentation results across the departments. That's not so great. Because like, what if they learned something that you could use to improve your bottom line? Like, we all win. We're all reaching for the same KPIs. We're all trying to build the same customer base. Why not share? Why not even post about it on LinkedIn or Twitter? I love testing Twitter. I get so many cool ideas there. The limit truly does not exist if we are constantly testing, because we will constantly be improving. I've linked all of those resources in this presentation here on my website, and I hope to see you all on Twitter. Woo! Woo!